<laughs> so um, I'm glad to be back at Chipola. Um, as he said, I went to Graceville. Uh, I graduated from uh, Graceville High in 1973. And in that class in that year, is anybody from Graceville in here, by the way? All right, all right, good. What, how many were in your graduating class? Forty-two? Is y'all same class? Forty-four. Okay, my class was the largest class in the history of Graceville, never before and not since then. Seventy-three. Wow. <laughs> Which sounds, when I tell people that I work with or have worked with that before, they laugh, right? Because they're used to, like, real big high schools. But for Graceville, that was pretty big uh, size. So then I came here at Chipola. I had a great time at Chipola. I uh, graduated in 75. I loved being here. I had great professors. They taught me um, how to do speech. Um, you may wonder after this, well, they didn't do a very good job. Um, <laughs> but uh, Ms. Wofford, who was from Graceville, and I went to school with her kids, um, was my speech teacher here at Chipola. And one of my uh, speeches was, how to tell when a watermelon is ripe. Uh, so I learned you talk about things that you know something about. Uh, and had great professors who had interest in us personally, individually, and it was a great background. Um, very solid. Honors English, uh, great math, took accounting. I took a lot of science courses. Back then I didn't know if I, my dad kept encouraging me to go into the medical field. So I was open to different things. I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. So I took uh, some heavy duty science courses uh, here at Chipola. I was in advanced chemistry classes and things. And my lab partner, I met uh, anybody from Chipley here. Y'all may have heard of Dr. Greg Sloan. He was my lab partner in chemistry here at Chipola. And then we became college roommates together at FSU. Um, and studied together uh, by that time. He was great in lab. Fortunately, I was very fortunate to have him as a lab partner because he was a lot better at it than I was. I, I could handle the study in the books and the texts and stuff okay, but the hands-on stuff, nah, I found out I needed to be doing something different. So I took uh, accounting here at um, Chipola and became interested in the business side of things. And so then went on to major in accounting at FSU and got a CPA and practiced with a, um, they, back then they called them a big eight firm. Now they call them big four, but it was an international accounting firm, Deloitte Haskins and Sells, and um, did a lot of different things around the state, uh, worked on big clients. It was a lot of fun. Uh, lived in Tampa for seven years, and then Deborah and I uh, moved back to Tallahassee. But one of the things that I've learned uh, in the course as, as uh, he was talking about my work on the farm, it instills a work ethic, and I know you have a work ethic uh, because you probably wouldn't be sitting here if you didn't um, in honors classes, but don't lose that. Uh, the first thing I want to tell you about three things, and then we're going to move on some questions, which will probably be more interesting. Um, work hard. I don't care how smart you are. And as I told the entering class of the FSU Law School just a few days ago when they came in, I did introductory remarks for them. And here's what I told them. They, that group, there's probably 165 of them entering class at FSU Law School. And they have one of the highest law school admission test scores and GPAs maybe ever at the law school. And I told them, I don't care how smart you are or how smart you think you are. There is no substitute for hard work. None. It doesn't exist. So I'll tell you the saying. You still have to work hard. So make grades. Make good grades. It's an interest uh, into the programs and the kind of vocations that you want to go to someday. Even though you're trying to sort it out, make good grades. The interest exams to graduate programs uh, or standardized tests like the law school admissions test, for the medical schools have admission tests, Gra all kind of graduate schools have admission tests that are standardized, right? Take them seriously. Prepare for them because 
surprisingly, there's a lot of weight into those things, sometimes more so than your grade point average. So you have to take those things seriously. Prepare. Take courses. Prepare yourself. Work hard. The second thing I would tell you is you're going to go on from here and you're going to become a graduate of this school and then you're going to look in to go to another school, right? Schools have reputations and you do too. That's the second point. Schools have reputations and you do too. Polston, what do you mean by that? Well, decide where you want to go and be careful about where you want to go. Be able to afford it. Don't go into a lot of debt, crazy debt, just to be able to go to some school that you think has a name to it. You don't have to go to an Ivy League school. Um, I sit on the bench. Um, now there's seven justices on the Florida Supreme Court. Two guys from Yale, one Harvard, one from a public Mississippi school, I think it was Mississippi State, and two of us went to FSU Law School, Justice uh, Alan Lawson and I. And we happened to have been in the same law school class together at FSU, and one from uh, Florida, University of Florida. So um, three of us out of the seven all went to for, uh, public um, state university schools to be able to get there. You can do that. So be careful about where you go to school. They have reputations. Pick a good school, it matters. And your reputation matters too. If you do crazy things and post it on Facebook and social media, and it'll come back to bite you. Uh, I don't care if you're in college, potential uh, admissions, employers, that stuff has a life and you can't get rid of it. So don't do stupid stuff. But if you do, sure as heck don't post it on social media. So um, better not to do it, okay? Because then you have a reputation, right? It goes with you wherever you go. Don't do stupid stuff. The third thing is that you have family and friends. Don't forget them. Be kind to them. You're meeting new friends, please do. Make new friends. Enjoy your time here at Chipola. We were talking about coming up in Graceville. It's a small town. Coming here for me, it was like going to a bigger high school. It was great, it was a lot of fun. We met people that uh, we played sports against, you know? Uh, people you competed against in different academic competitions and different things. It was great fun. And then when you go on uh, to, you might go on to a different university with some of the same friends. Um, and you'll meet new ones, but don't forget about them. And especially your family. You're going to be successful someday in whatever vocation you choose to do. I know you will because you're successful so far. You will succeed. Don't forget who helped get you there. Does that make sense? Um, and um, be kind to people along the way. So that's, in essence, my three things that I wanted to tell you. Uh, but more interestingly, I'd be glad to take any questions from y'all. And Brian's got some backup questions, but I'd rather hear from y'all if that's okay. Um, I teach at the law school, so I'm used to walking around. Can I walk around? Is that okay with y'all? Is that okay with y'all up there? Okay. Yes? So is there like a big deciding moment that you decided that you wanted to go to law school? That's a great question. Um, for me, uh, in accounting, studying accounting, they have one of the things that you do is business law. And so I was interested in business law at the time. Uh, and I considered going into law school then, but uh, there was a beautiful young lady I really wanted to get married to right away. Uh, so uh, I thought it was better for me to get married and work a while before uh, considering that anymore. And so I, when I worked uh, in the accounting firm, I, I had a great time. I enjoyed doing accounting work. Uh, we did audits of different companies. We'd go around to different places and different cities and different industries, and it was very interesting. Um, 
But I just reached the point where in about three years from then, I was going to make partner in this accounting firm, which for then was like the mecca of the accounting world, right? To be a partner in one of those big firms. So I knew if I did, that's what I was going to do the rest of my life. So it was really um, a point of, do I really want to do that the rest of my life or not? So I felt like I reached a, a point in time where I needed to decide, am I going to do this or something different? And after a lot of thought and prayer, I decided that I'm going to do something different. So that's, what, that's how it led to it. And he's right, my parents thought I'd lost my mind. Um, We, we tried selling, my wife and I had a house in Tampa, we tried selling, uh, but when I remember when we packed the U-Haul up to, to move to Tallahassee to go to law school, and we, our oldest daughter had been born at the time. She was about 18 months old. And I remember looking back and my wife was sitting there with my baby on the front step crying. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, what have I done? You know? But it worked out. Yes, sir. You went from graduating from graduate law school to eventually being appointed by Governor um, Jeb Bush to first court of appeals, right. Governor Chris to the Supreme Court. What has led to your success from the, the small Graysville, top of your class, to Florida State, and eventually to the Supreme Court? That, that's a very good question, and I encourage you on this way. And I talked a little bit about the Ivy League educations, right, um, and even from other schools. Don't ever back off from anybody because of you think you've been to a small place in a small school. You're just as smart as anybody else. Don't ever like think that you have some kind of substandard education or substandard opportunity. You graduate from here, you're on the same playing ground as anybody else. And you do well, and you do well wherever you go, then you can compete. Don't back off. Don't feel like you're at somehow some disadvantage. Um, so the key is to be successful where you are, right? So if you're at Chipola, be successful, do good, work hard. You go to FSU, University of Florida, wherever it is you go, work hard. Be successful in whatever you do. And so when you start tr making a successful track record, then success builds on success. You meet people. The third thing I said, don't be jerks to people. You know, that'll come back to bite you. It's better, but this, the reverse is true too. If you're nice to people and you genuinely care about people, then you make friends. Friends help you, right? And so you, and to, to do any of that, you do need friends. So you need both, like people ask me, how do you get on the court? Is it political or is it on merit, right? It's really kind of both. Um, the honest answer is you got to be able to show a success record, but you have to be able to have people willing to help you in some way, um, too. The first time I ever met Governor Bush was in my interview with him. I didn't know him. The first time I ever met Governor Chris was in my interview with him. I didn't know him either, you know? But I knew people who did, who were willing to speak up to say good things about me. Um, so work hard where you are, start there, build a successful, um, a success story of where you are. If you're practicing law, be good at it. You really need to be good at it. Um, so that's how you get to places like that. Um, yes, ma'am. You know, what was the difference? What, um, when I went back to school, I was seven years out, mm -hmm. right? And I had studied hard for the CPA. I was fortunate enough to pass it the first time. So, but it was still, you did a lot of studying for that. So I was really six years out from having to do really hard stuff. So the hard part was not as much the academics, it was trying to financially survive. <laughs> so because, I told you about leaving the house in Tampa. Our, our game plan was to sell the house and live off the equity. But because they were building so many newer homes in Tampa at the same time, we couldn't sell our existing home because of the market of new homes. So we were stuck with two house payments. Um, so 
pretty quickly in my second year, I had to pivot. I was teaching accounting at FSU and TCC, um, in addition to going to law school, interning at the Senate Commerce uh, Committee, which is the opportunity the law school presented. Uh, Deborah, my wife, was an excellent seamstress. She still is, but doesn't do it as much anymore. She was sewing for wedding uh, bridesmaids' dresses, you know, brides' gowns, doing uh, alterations, uh, doing stuff out of the home. So we were busting it, trying to survive financially. Uh, that was the most difficult part was those three years. It was hard. Y'all ask good questions. <laughs> All right, Ricky, let me throw out some of these that... Uh, Y'all should have kept asking. Huh? <laughs> and, and you can still break in now if you think of one. Yeah, okay. Uh, how has growing up from a small community influenced your career, um, especially as it relates to serving on the Supreme Court? Um, well, as I told you, it's just um, you get used to people... Um, investing in you in a personal way and being able to relate to people. You know, when growing up in a small town, I don't know about you, but my teachers were friends of my parents, right? And so they're interested in you, and if you're driving around doing something you shouldn't have, the chances are you have a lot of eyes on you, right? And so there's less chance of you getting into, into trouble or doing things that you shouldn't. Uh, they have more interest in you succeeding at the um, uh, right off the bat, there was a lawyer in my Judicial Nominating Commission panel that um, was there when I first came on the first DCA, and he was from Blunstown. Um, and so he asked, he kind of smiled and asked, a que asked that question, like, you know, what, what was it like growing up in a small town so far as your academics? And so it was a similar kind of answer. So. Um, you're able to relate to people, all kind of people, um, and uh, less inclined to be a jerk along the way. All right, let's try this one. Oh, he, he's got a question right here. Oh, here we go. Okay. Since you're on the Supreme Court, I assume you know about this. Is there any way that Florida law is significantly different than other states? Um, yeah, well, sometimes there is. So um, there's as you observe, there's federal law, which applies everywhere because of the, um, um, the Constitution requires that if there's a conflict, then the, the, the supremacy clause of the Constitution says that federal law trumps any kind of conflicting state law. But there are, state laws are different in some ways, like I'll give you an example. Um, if they haven't changed it, Georgia law apparently is if you have if you're married and own property together, um, in Florida, if, you own, if you're married and own property together and one of you die, it goes to the other one automatically. That's not true in Georgia. Uh, so um, that, can, that can matter to whoever the heirs are <laughs> and to the surviving spouse. So property law is different. Family law is different. Um, so there are some significant differences in uh, how you do that. That's why you have to be admitted to practice in each state that you go to. And in Florida, we test on um, Florida law. The Florida Supreme Court, let me say this about a uh, quick civics lesson. The Florida Supreme Court is like the head of the branch of the judicial branch, right? Three branches, executive, which is the governor, and the state agencies, the legislative branch, and then the judicial branch. The Florida Supreme Court is officially in Florida the head of the branch with the chief justice who acts as the operating officer, if you will, of the branch. And then that person is selected by the Florida Supreme Court who acts kind of like a board of directors, almost like a corporation. So um, that's how that works and then the Florida Supreme Court also has by the Florida Constitution supervisory power over the regulation of lawyers which we do through the Florida Bar and also the admission of lawyers which we do through the Florida Board of Bar Examiners. 
So we were responsible for how it is people get to become lawyers in Florida and what you got to be able to test on in order to, to become a lawyer there. That's a long answer to your question, but the, sh the short answer is, yeah, it's different. Yeah. So, uh, what's been your favorite memory from either law school or your law career? Uh -huh. Ah, uh, well, I'd have to say getting sworn in to the Florida Supreme Court is my favorite memory of the, of the, um, of my law career, and and in part because, even though my mom at the time had passed away, and my brother was kind enough, he and my sister-in-law put an oak tree out here or planted an oak tree, that says in memory of Sydney and Hortense Paulson and my parents right out here at Chapala, and um, it was my dad's 80th birthday the day I was sworn in on the, on, to the Florida Supreme Court. My dad um, and mom originally came from Holmes County. Anybody from there? Okay, so they came from Holmes County. Um, I farmed a lot over near Poplar Springs. Um, was the, the old homestead property over there. I did a lot of hours on the tractor over there. Um, my dad only had the opportunity to go to the 10th grade. And that's because his two older brothers were drafted in World War II at the time, and he had to go back to the family farm in order for the family to survive. My mom graduated from high school at Graceville and was a bookkeeper there at a store. Um, but that was as far as the education opportunity presented them. They were insistent that my brother and I have an opportunity here at Chapala and then on to FSU and we took advantage of that opportunity, just like y'all are today. And there may be somebody in your life who did something similar or provided, helped provide a way for you or you are for yourself to be able to go to college. Make the most of it. Make the most of it. Work hard. Yes, ma'am. Does a small town influence in a way? Like, do you think about the small towns of Florida when deciding on You know, in the administrative things that come up, I remember, I mean, I'm very aware that, that Miami is different than being in Graceville, right? Um, so when a court proceeding in Mariana here is going to be different than one in, Mar in uh, Miami. I've been to the courthouses. I know what they're like, and I've, I've, pra I've actually practiced in them before. So um, when you're talking about administrative matters and how you do things, then you're aware that there's differences, right? But so far as deciding an individual case is concerned, not really. I mean, sometimes it has helped me in deciding cases where they start talking about how tall a fence needs to be for a cow versus a hog, you know. <laughs> uh, it's like, you going to put a fence up, you know, six feet so a hog doesn't jump it, seriously? You know, yeah. Excuse me, I forgot to turn it off. Um, you know, I don't know. Um, it's been more of a process mm -hmm. instead of just like um, not just one thing. I will say the most culture shock I got, okay, was when I graduated from FSU. And I went to Miami for a job interview with an accounting firm. Again, one of the big eight at that time. Um, and I flew there, getting on an airplane for the first time. I was a senior at FSU. This was 1977, first time I'd ever flown, ever. So I get on the airplane, I go down and check into the hotel. It was like, I don't know, Holiday Inn or something like that, downtown Miami. And I walk out onto the balcony trying to scout out a place to go eat some, somewhere. And I'm way up, and I go on the balcony, I'm looking down, and there's two guys down on the um, street level. 
and they see me up on the balcony and they're looking up and they're saying they look up and they spot me and they say jump <laughs> <laughs> that was culture shock <laughs> i thought wow welcome to miami <laughs> so that was the biggest one moment culture shock i think i remember flying for the first time going in a big place and then have two guys tell me to commit suicide as soon as, <laughs> as, 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 soon as they saw me. It was not something I was accustomed to. You know? But other than that, it's just a gradual thing, you know, getting exposed to more things, seeing new places um, is always a good thing. Yes, ma'am. How did you get the opportunity to travel to all these places? <laughs> Got in the car and went. <laughs> <laughs> No, we would, um, I would work hard, and then for um, when the girls were growing up, um, we took them on road trips, uh, long two or three week road trips. We would go to California, and we would go like up north through, we, we drove where most people would drive, you know, I mean, where most people would fly. Uh, we um, had a big conversion van, and it was fun driving, and we just drove a lot and went to different places. And, and the thing about uh, the Europe trips were, we made the promise to the girls, when you graduate high school, we'll take you on any trip, anywhere you wanna go. Now, we didn't let them go on school trips. That was the thing. We didn't want them going on school trips because we didn't want them to quite trust them you know, enough. But, but when you graduate from high school, we'll go. Okay, so <laughs> Diana. Our oldest daughter, first one up, right? Okay, where would you like to go? I'm thinking, you know, somewhere in the United States. I'd like to go to Australia. <laughs> what? Yeah, Australia, that's my choice. Okay, so here we go. And then uh, the next one, the next daughter we took to uh, Italy and Austria. Um, the third one we went to um, England, Scotland, Ireland, and then the last to Hawaii. Uh, and then one of the guys more recently went on a, a cruise to Alaska. Uh, so it was a great promise to make because we never would have gone to any of those places had we not promised, yeah, we'll do something like that. Um, so that's, we promised our way into, into those trips. I encourage it to travel. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. Favorite place where? That you've visited? Uh, here in the States. Um, you know, one of the places I really like is Yellowstone out west. I think it's just beautiful. Um, so I really like, I would say Yellowstone. Yes, ma'am. Did the decision change career path and go back to school? Was that something that you struggled with or you kind of just made? The decision? Yes, sir. Um, you know, the other part of that story was I, I kept trying to get my wife to go back to law school. Um, and I said, why don't you go back to law, why don't you go to law school? I said, no, I don't want to. And I kept, would keep nagging her about it. And she said, you obviously want somebody to go to law school, you go to law school. And then I started, well, okay, maybe I'm seriously thinking about this. But um, uh, if you haven't figured this out by now, we've done some crazy things in our life. <laughs> like adopting six boys, you know. Um, and we, we've kind of marched our own drummer and um, done things differently. And it's been challenging, but as I told my wife the other day, it's never been boring. Uh, so it was, uh, it was challenging. At first when you get there and it's so hard financially, it was a real struggle, but it was, it was the right decision. When you know, you know. Yes, ma'am. How old were the boys when you got them? Say it again. How old were the boys when you got them? They were uh, uh, nine, three, and almost two. Um, and then once we got them, they all came out of the state foster care system. The birth mom had uh, another one six months into it. And then two years later, and then two years later, and we decided, I mean, we didn't have to adopt the others as they came, but we decided to keep the sibling group together. 
They're crazy. I got too many kids. <laughs> yeah. How did you and your wife meet? Sorry? How did you and your wife meet? Oh, we met as, as a blind date. <laughs> um, I, she was, um, and we knew, both knew somebody, a mutual friend, um, set us up. And he says to me, hey, Ricky. Um, and he says, I got this girl I want to uh, set you up with at a church Valentine's banquet. And I said, yeah, let me guess. She's got a great personality. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, no, seriously, I'll set you up with her. I said, bring me a picture. And so he did, and he brought me a picture, and I said, sign me up. Um, and so um, he said, she wants a picture, too. I said, no, it'll screw up the deal. <laughs> So I didn't give him a picture. So that's how we met, was on a blind date. February 14, 1977. All right, let me ask this one. As uh, college students entering our respective career fields, what advice do you have to offer us on balancing our career and personal life? And then the second part, since you have such a large family, <laughs> did you find that hard to balance? <laughs> It is. Um, so um, I would say technology has made it better to balance, uh, easier to balance because, um, for example, like uh, as the boys are growing up, they're out playing on the playing at practice or soccer field and stuff or doing whatever. If I've got my iPad with me, which is in the trunk of my car, if I have my iPad with me, I can be working and usually am. Uh, so I can sit and watch uh, the boys play football, basketball, wherever, whatever they're doing. And if I've got my iPad going, um, I can be watching them and working at the same time. Um, so uh, if I'm sitting at home uh, and somebody's got the TV on, I, I can kind of tune things out. My wife says I do it a lot. Uh, I can tune things out and I can be sitting there if, if I'm if the TV's on unless FSU football is crashing and burning again like they did last Saturday <laughs> I'm usually there with an iPad um, in my lap while the TV's going and and my kids will say are you working because they don't know if I'm working or reading the news you know and sometimes alternating back and forth pretty quickly between us so um, the balance has been being able to do some of all of it uh, growing up when the girls were little before the boys came along uh, we would eat dinner late uh, I'd be practicing law and I'd come in and we would all get home and we would eat dinner maybe 7 30 8 o'clock which I guess by most people's standards that's late is that late for no that's not late for a lot of people, that's late. You eat at five? Um, I don't know. We would eat by other people's standards fairly late. But we ate together. And um, uh, even in law school, when we were having, like, the deal with Deborah was not to slow down having a family while I was in law school. So in my second year, we had another baby. Our second one came in the second year, and at the, at the tail end of my third year, we had another one. Intentionally, can you believe that? <laughs> Not by accident, it was intentional. Um, so, but while I was in law school, I would help, I would go in and um, uh, help get, while Deborah was getting a shower or whatever, I'd hold the baby and feed the evening bottle. And then and help put them to bed. And then I would make time to go uh, sit with Deborah and have a bowl of ice cream around 11.30 at night, and then she'd go to bed and I'd go back to studying. Uh, so it was making specific scheduled times that you, you know you're going to do that and stick to it is a better way to kind of balance it out. Y'all are a good group. You're going to do well. Um, let me get a sense. Who all wants to do something in the medical field? Wow. Awesome. Who all wants to do something in the law field? Awesome. Glad you're doing that. Yeah. <laughs> Business. Engineering. 
Uh, anything else? What what you got in mind? Uh, yeah. Okay. Like. Uh, great. That's great. Um, you're going to be great. You're going to do awesome. And uh, I look forward to seeing successful stories about all of you someday. If you get over to Tallahassee, uh, come to the court. Give a yell. And uh, say hello. Is there anything else? We good? <laughs>